All right. I'm just curious, how many people were Wall Street lawyers and then they decided, ah, that's a stupid job. I'm just gonna come out to here and, and work in San Francisco. How many people have law degrees in here? Sorry. All right, a yeah. couple. Do you, have, do you have your law school debt still that you're paying back? All right. Yeah. Do you have law school debt? No, I paid it off already. Podcasting's really lucrative. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Highly recommended. Now, I want to know why a non-billionaire is writing a book about how billionaires think and why we should listen to you. Well, it's a good question. No wonder you're the Larry King of podcasting. Yeah, yeah. I think only a non-billionaire should write about it. So what, what happened was, is that, um, and I write about this in, in other books, but I, was, I had this bad experience where I was starting businesses, selling them, making some money, and then thinking, this is it. I've accomplished all my goals in life. Now I can just do whatever I want because I'm a genius because I sold some business. And then immediately I would lose all my money and maybe lose a home or a family along with it. And I'd get depressed and it would be a miserable experience. Like I sort of feel lately there's been this genre of failure porn where you write or talk about your failures and that's kind of like a, a, a bad, it's this weird honorable badge where now you're ready for success because you've experienced all these failures. But failure is really just ugly and miserable. Like you just, it, you just want to die when you fail. And, or at least I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about you. And so I figured, what am I doing wrong? It's almost like statistically significant, the number of times I've just lost everything. And what am I doing wrong on the way down? And what am I doing right on the way up? And so when I started this podcast, I figured, okay, I'm going to interview all these successful people. And one category of successful people are these successful billionaires. They've started businesses. They've started multiple businesses. They, they seem to magically go from success to success to success. Are they just lucky? Or do they have some habits in place that are different than me? And what can I learn from it? Like, are these habits replicable? Like, can I learn what they did? Can I learn what Richard Branson did and somehow figure out maybe I can try some of his habits myself and that will help me avoid failure and, and depression or mania, whichever it is that was causing me this, this anguish and, and, and learn something. And maybe next time I could hold on to my money, or maybe next time I could be more creative, or maybe next time I could figure out how to have more impact on people, and so on. So I, I, I interviewed all these people, and I did see some things in common. And it's not just billionaires, by the way. I've interviewed you know, Hall of Fame level athletes. I've interviewed many authors. I, I really love interviewing authors because I'm a writer myself. Uh, I've interviewed probably people from every industry in life, peak performers from every industry in life, and, you know, but, but, but people are fascinated, extra fascinated by billionaires. In fact, in today's world, not only are they fascinated, but they're also angered. So depending on who you are. But I was really just focusing not on the, the political spectrum, but the, the habit spectrum. What are they doing differently than me? And how can I replicate it? That was the main focus I had. And how can I share it with others? So billionaires think a certain way. That's her thesis here. They think a certain way that's different from how other business owners think. Yeah, I think that's definitely true because I compare how a lot of these people think compared to how I think, even when I was building businesses and succeeding and even when I was failing. And I see that when these people are succeeding, they're, all, they're still thinking diff very differently than how when I was succeeding. Well, let's talk about the skills that billionaires have. Is it about skills or is it about the way that they think, like the meta skill level? It's definitely not about skills. In fact, I wouldn't say any billionaire has stood out because of their skills. So for instance, it's not like Sarah Blakely, who created Spanx, had any skills in the fashion industry. In fact, before she, for the eight years before she started Spanx, how many women here are wearing Spanx right now? <laughs> Raise your hand. <clears throat> we won't tell anyone. It's only on video on YouTube. Uh, so, so Sarah I'm Blakely, wearing Spanx right now. 
They have a men, men's fangs. Uh, Sarah Blakely was selling fax machines door to door for eight years before she started Spanx. She had no experience in the fashion industry. So it was, and, and none of these, Richard Branson had no experience in the airline industry when he started an airline. Mark Cuban didn't know, you know, streaming audio was just starting on the internet and he wasn't, he was sort of a software guy, but not really. He didn't have any experience, enough experience to create broadcast.com. And I'm just going down the whole list of people. Nobody, basically nobody had experience at what they ended up making billions at. They, nobody had any skills that they directly applied, but they did have very similar meta skills. And I can go over them, you know, one by one, but certainly an extreme curiosity was one. And that seems like kind of obvious, but it wasn't the sort of curiosity that I have, you know, on my daily life. I'll give you an example. I was interviewing Ken Langone, who started Home Depot. And, you know, he, he was already a millionaire by the time he started Home Depot, but that's really where he made his, his billions. And in the beginning of the podcast, we were, we were sitting upstairs in a comedy club that I happened to be the owner of. And he started asking me, he, he, got, he got really intense. Once he saw, heard that I owned this comedy club or I co-owned this comedy club, he got really intense. His eyes like squinted and he said, well, how much do you pay for every beer? How much do you sell it for? How much do the waitresses make? Uh, uh, how many, what's your turnaround per show? And I didn't know the answer to any of his questions at all. Like it was like I was the worst business owner on the planet. And he like immediately dived down on everything that I should have known about my own business. And I didn't know anything. And I heard later actually, I don't know if it was true or not, but someone told me that he, he wasn't very impressed by me. And, <laughs> but at the same time, at the same time, you know, I, I, there's other skills that he, that he had too, that I was very impressed by. And uh, again, I could just, I could tell stories about each skill. I could tell stories about each billionaire. We'll get there. They're, 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 they're all interesting. I'll, mo I'll moderate this conversation. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Don't worry about it. I'll lead the way. You mentioned that billionaires often follow the arc of the hero, which is kind of an interesting way to, to look at it. I mean, why would billionaires be unique in that aspect or in that respect? What, why, what was, why that, was, that billionaires often follow the arc of the hero. So like the, the hero's journey. Yeah. So think about like, again, uh, Richard Branson mm -hmm. is, is a great example. So, so, and this one story I just, I just love in, in a variety of ways. So Richard Branson, was, again, was already doing well. He was a successful music magazine publisher. He was 27 years old and something happened to him. He, he was taking a plane. I might get the exact locations wrong, but he was taking a plane from the Caribbean to Puerto Rico where he was going to meet a lady friend of his and the plane got canceled and he really wanted to get to Puerto Rico. So he found uh, somebody who had a private jet and he said, I'm leasing your private jet to take me to Puerto Rico. He didn't have any money on him. He didn't have enough money to get this private jet to take him to Puerto Rico. But he said to the guy, I want, consider it done. I have the money. Just give me a few minutes and don't lease it to anybody else. I'm taking this private jet. He didn't have any money. So he goes back into the airport and he puts up a sign. He figures out all the people who were just canceled because this jet from this commercial jet from the Caribbean to Puerto Rico was canceled. And he put up a sign and he said, it's $49 a ticket. Cause he figured out if everybody put in $49, he could, he could at least have enough money to lease his private jet to take them to Puerto Rico. So they all signed up. He sold these tickets. Then he officially gave the money to lease the jet and he got to Puerto Rico. So there's a couple of things interesting in that story and it's related to the arc of the hero. First off, the hero, the, the arc of the hero is this kind of skeleton of, the, of primal stories, like the story of Jesus, the story of Buddha, these stories that just are so primal, we relate to them thousands of years later. So that even like Luke Skywalker, beat by beat, will mimic the story of Jesus, say, or the story of basically any great hero throughout religion or history or whatever. And... And the same thing happens in our lives. And so it's a question to ask, like, where are you or where am I in my own story of the arc of the hero? But there's there, always one. 
so 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 the call so the, in the arc of the hero the first step is the call to action where some event happens usually something tragic in this case richard branson can't get to his girlfriend and 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 you have to do something that you've never done before to take that first step on the hero's journey and so what he what he did was he he, he did this concept which i call throughout the book ready fire aim so usually when you start a business you come up with the idea, you build a product, maybe you raise some money, and then you start getting customers and making money. But none of these billionaires follow the standard ready, aim, you know, ready, aim, fire. They all did ready, fire, aim. So, so Richard Branson wanted to get to Puerto Rico. That was his ready, but he fired before he aimed. He leased the private jet without having any money at all. And then he raised the money. So he fired give me the jet. And then he aimed, he raised the money for the jet He's, without knowing if he could do it or not, but he did it. And, and then he thinks to himself, huh, that was pretty easy. I just arranged for a bunch of people to fly a plane from one location to another. And here's this 27 year old, no experience in the airline industry, music publisher. And he thinks to himself, I'm going to start an airline. Who would do that? That's insane. But again, this uh, two things are happening. This ready, fire, aim approach. He, he, he takes now to starting any a, a much bigger airline. And then in the arc of the hero, what happens is, is you solve that first problem. You, you you get the call to action. You go on your journey. You solve the first problem, and then you give your and then successively bigger problems happen. So Luke Skywalker first escapes Tatooine, and now he's got to rescue Princess Leia, and then he has a much bigger problem. He's got to blow up the Death Star. But Richard Branson doesn't have to blow up the Death Star, but first he gets this private jet to Puerto Rico. Now he says, I'm gonna, I'm 27 years old, music magazine publisher. England has a, a government monopoly airline already, British Airways. There's, you, everybody kept saying, him, you can't start an airline. British Airways is a monopoly. And what are you gonna do? They're not gonna let you have an airstrip in Heathrow. You don't have a, a plane costs $150 million. Where are you going to get a plane? And Richard Brands is like, I don't care. I'm just going to start an airline. So he calls Boeing. He calls Boeing out of the blue. He, he doesn't know who to talk to. He calls Boeing and he borrows an airplane from them. They, it, how does he, I can't call. Can you call Boeing and borrow an airplane? What would you say even? You would you say, hey, I would really like to borrow a $150 million plane from you. I'll give it back in a year or so, which is what he said to them. And so he has this ability to persuade, and obviously this is a huge problem. And so how does he persuade them? He says, listen, you have no, there's no competition in England. You have no pricing pressure. British Airways could pay whatever they want for a plane. You have to sell it to them. It's better for you, Boeing, if there are two airlines in the UK. And Boeing's like, hmm, this guy could be an idiot or he could be right. So they lend him a plane for a year. And the same thing with Heathrow, they give him one landing strip and JFK gives him one landing strip. And now he actually can fly people from Heathrow to JFK. He's got an airline, Virgin Atlantic is, is launched. And so again, the problems get bigger and bigger. How do you fly to other cities? How do you get more airplanes? How do you stay in business? The airplane industry is very difficult. Then how do you launch a spaceship? Because now he's got Virgin Galactic. So again, that's that arc of the hero. The problems get bigger and bigger until you, you've solved the biggest problem of all, and then you come back to tell your story. That's the arc of the hero. And so he, Richard Branson has told the story. He's come on my podcast. He's written several books. And he's kind of very, you know, very easily followed the, the hero's journey. But also, I'm really impressed by his ability to do this ready, fire, aim over and over he like starts a business gets the customers and everything he needs then figures it out and that's a common a common theme throughout many of the people i interviewed so damon john is just, just a great example the guy was a waiter in red lobster that was his job and then on the weekends he'd stand on the corner and sell hats with like ll cool j logos on it uh to whoever passed by he goes to one clothing convention and I think it was Macy's. Yeah, it was Macy's. 
makes a hundred thousand dollar order of hats. What does he do? He doesn't say, Oh, I, I can't knit you a hundred thousand dollars worth of hats. Maybe next year. He doesn't say that. He says, yes, done. So waiter in red lobster, how is he going to make a hundred thousand dollars worth of hats in a week? Here's what he does. He mortgages his mom's house. He hires then 20 seamstresses to go in the house all day long and sew $100,000 worth of clothing, gives it to Macy's. Macy's pays him the $100,000. He, he buys back the mortgage, so he gives, gives his mom back her house. And again, it's this ready, fire, aim strategy while he's a, a waiter. He doesn't even think to say, nah, I'm just a waiter. I can't do this. He says yes, figures it out later, which could be a very dangerous strategy, but he kind of knew what he was doing. It's, it, it actually, if you think about it, is a very risk-free strategy. He had the customer in place, Macy's. Then he, he figured nothing can go wrong because I know Macy's is going to pay if I deliver. So he mortgages the house, which sounds really risky, but he knows where the money is going to come from to pay for, the mor- pay for the mortgage back. And then he makes all the products. Again, a very much a ready, fire, aim sort of story. So that was one. I think I would be too n- nervous to do that sort of strategy. Although I found consistently again and again, that was a successful strategy for these billionaires. By the way, he stayed being a waiter at Red Lobster even after this until he made several more of those types of orders. There, that might that doesn't sound legal, that whole mortgage your mom's house. I'm not a practicing lawyer anymore, but I'm pretty sure that you have to ask before you do that. The strategy sounds fun, right? But it's also really like objectively a bad idea to do that. Don't you think? I, I don't know. Because again, I, I, you can go down the entire list of billionaires like Sarah Blake. But isn't that survivor bias? Like, hey, she made it rich. Oh, that guy went to jail. We don't talk about it. Well, here. that's a really good point. So with every billionaire, you have to ask, were these strategies survivorship bias? Meaning, are we only hearing about the ones who succeeded, the 15 who succeeded, yeah. not the 6,000 people who lost their homes when they couldn't deliver. Yeah, they flew to Macy's. They ready fire aimed their way into their mom's basement. So 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 I don't think you have to I don't think you have to buy borrow a hundred fifty million dollar airplane and I don't think you have to mortgage your mom's house, but having some sense that you can say yes to things that other people are saying no to. Whenever someone says and this is a related strategy, but whenever someone says you can't do this, that's usually means there's some opportunity here. It might not be the most obvious opportunity, but like, like people would probably say to Richard Branson, you can't do this. Or people would say to Damon John, you can't do this. You're just a waiter at Red Lobster. People would say to Sarah Blakely, you can't do this. You're just uh, selling fax machines door to door. And it's going on the other, the only way to succeed is when everyone else thinks they can't do something and you're the only one who's doing it. That's really where you'll find success. And it almost sounds like a cliche, but, but it's really true. If everyone's doing it, if it was easy for everyone, then there's not a billion dollars waiting there for you to su- succeed. Now, I'm not saying they, they took huge, it almost seems like they took huge risks in their ready, fire, aim strategy. Okay, take smaller ones. Not everyone, you don't need to be a billionaire. I don't need to be a billionaire. I'm just trying to see what's in common with all of these billionaires. Maybe I can mimic those habits just a little bit. Maybe I could say to myself, okay, if I have an idea, what's a way to test out this idea rather than, you know, I see so many people who come up with ideas and they think to themselves, this is a great idea. I'm going to raise a lot of money. I'm going to spend a year building the product and really planning this out. And then I'm going to find a customer. That's like traditional ready, aim, fire. Though I see so many of those businesses that, act, that, that fail horribly because they didn't have the customer first. And they didn't just say yes to the customer first and then figure it out how they were going to get it done. Instead, they thought in their own, it's almost more risky and more ego to say, my idea is great. I'm going to raise a ton of money. I'm going to build this product that somebody may or may not want. And then I'm going to, and I'm going to quit my job because I raised all this money. And then I'm going to find a customer because I'm such a genius that there's got to be customers for this. And I've fallen prey to that mistake. Whereas I think it's actually less risky, say yes to a customer and then figure it out. And I I, I think there's probably a lot more examples from billionaires and even millionaires of that approach than the other.
I would agree with that. I mean, it's hard without stats, but it does sort of give credence to the claim. A lot of people will say, well, you know, you have to do something unethical to be a billionaire. It's a common belief, right? We talked about this before, actually. Yeah. Why does this belief exist other than some of them are mortgaging their mom's house without permission? But other than that, why do you think people say things like that? Uh, well, I did think he did get his mom's permission. Okay. I think, I think she, she was a believer, but uh, it's still scary. But I think, I mean, I heard a quote recently from some politician that a billion, billionaires exist because they, they take the billion, they don't earn it, which is a very interesting quote because who are they taking it from? But it's not like everybody stands online to give money to billionaires and right. not other people. But, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of, people feel there's, it's unfair because if you think that money should only be earned by labor per hour, then it's impossible to ever earn a billion dollars. So if you have a philosophy that, you know, money is in exchange for time and effort that you put in, then having a billion dollars feels unfair because nobody could ever earn an hourly wage that will get them to a billion dollars. But the reality is, is that a billion is usually, a, a, no, we, we create the billionaires. It's not like the billionaires appear magically out of nowhere, we create them. So Amazon, amazon.com is a great example. We all started buying from Amazon in the late 90s and the early 00s and they, they started to expand from books to clothes to, you know, electric, electronic equipment and computers and, and movies and, and so on. And then they go public. And then we here all buy the shares. And that's what creates a billionaire. So we, at every step of the way, we gave permission for Jeff Bezos to have more and more wealth. Nobody ever said, well, I'm stopping buying from Amazon today because this is about as wealthy as Jeff Bezos should get. We create the billionaires. We all, and, and you know, and, and Jeff Bezos solved this massive problem. We buy, why do we buy from Amazon? Because I'm going to get delivered whatever it is I'm buying. I'm getting it delivered tomorrow. Heck, I might, you know, I might get delivered it today. And as AI gets bigger, I'm going to get delivered yesterday. Like Amazon Prime, there's going to be Amazon yesterday at some point. And I'm not even, they're going to know what I'm thinking and I'm going to get delivered the book I want yesterday. So, you know, and then drones are going to come in. How much wine have you guys served tonight before we got here? <laughs> oh yeah. I haven't even started drinking. Jeez, wine yeah. Yet. Have a sip. <laughs> got to catch up with those people in the back. And you know, and it's the same thing. It's not like it's, it, you know, you can argue income inequality is so great. And yet, the quality of life at every strata of society has gone up in every percentage, whatever percentile you're in, longevity has gone up, infant mortality has gone down, literacy has gone up on every standard quality of life has gone up. So I think income inequality is almost the wrong metric, which is why, and look, I don't usually think about it. I didn't, I didn't write this book or interview these billionaires in order to justify their existence, but I really wanted to just learn what habits they had that I could, that I could emulate. But at the same time, I also appreciate like take Ken Langone from Home Depot. So one thing he said, I learned so many things from one interview with this guy. But one thing is if you if you go to New York city and if you go to the hospital, chances are the hospital is named the Langone or the NYU Langone hospital. He's basically donated to every single hospital in New York city. If you go to medical school in New York city, chances are your tuition is being paid by Ken Langone. I think he's paying the tuition of every single medical student in New York City. You know, not every billionaire is charitable, but Bill Gates, if you, why, why hasn't the US government solved malaria in Africa? And yet Bill Gates, in a few short years of applying himself and his money and his intelligence to malaria in Africa, he's almost solved the issue. Why hasn't, the US government or most of industry figured out how solar panels could be more efficient. And yet I just read a few weeks ago, a Bill Gates funded company has figured out how to triple the efficiency on solar panels. And so many of these people are using their money for charitable efforts or actually profitable efforts that are doing good in society. And again, not every single one of them, you can't go down the list of all the billionaires and say, oh my God, he's, they're also ethical, but again, it's worth, it's worth looking at how do they look at problems? 
How do they solve them? And it turns out to be very different from how, for me, it turned out to be very different from how I look at problems and how I solve them. Like when I started my first business, my first business made websites for other companies. And this was in the mid nineties. So not everyone was doing it, but a few companies were doing it. There was maybe at the time when I started doing it in New York city, there were maybe five or six other companies doing it. There was nothing special about my company. And I was competing with every client. I was competing against the exact same five companies. And you see a lot of these billionaires. I, so I basically copied, I had a copycat business model. I basically copied what five or six other companies were doing and figured, okay, I could do it. Maybe I could be a little cheaper, but as I grew, I wasn't even much cheaper than my competitors. But all of these billionaires, they did things that were very different. They went into areas or industries that were very different. So take, for instance, a billionaire that's not mentioned in this book, but I've interviewed recently, um, Jim McElvey started, was a co-founder of Square with Jack Dorsey. What did he do? So you all probably know what Square does. It, it, they give you that little device, you plug it into your iPhone or your iPad, and now you can accept credit cards all of a sudden. So, so many mom and pop companies couldn't accept credit cards because the banks didn't trust them and there was a lot of fraud and who knows what other reasons. Now Square allows 25% of American businesses to accept credit cards. And what did he do? What was the thing that he did that was different? Well, he took the bottom third of the population, the bottom third that was starting businesses at least, and these people were not allowed to accept credit cards. Banks wouldn't let them accept credit cards. Credit card processors wouldn't let them accept credit cards. He figured out a way to serve the bottom third of businesses to accept credit cards using his Square device. And now 25% of all American businesses use Square to uh, accept credit cards. So, so what did he do different? He, he, he took a market that nobody at all was serving not a copycat business. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to open up another bank or I'm going to open up another credit card processor. He opened up one to serve this enormous population that nobody ever thought of serving before. And everyone kept telling him, you can't do this. By the way, it was illegal to do it at the time. He convinced the laws to change. He convinced Visa to allow this to happen. Visa, it was against Visa's rules to, to allow Square to happen. He convinced them to let it happen. So he, he overcome these great big challenges. And, and that's, again, on the other side of can't, the other side of the word can't is where billions of dollars could be found or millions, depending on how big the problem is that you're trying to solve. Again, for me, my first business, I solved the problem that other people were solving. Again, there was only a few of us, so I had my own place in the industry, but it wasn't going to ever scale to billions. I only did you know, what I could. And so it was a much smaller problem because I wasn't engaging in these habits that I later learned these billionaires always engage in. You said in the book that you'd never met a billionaire whose kids were as hungry as they were. So how do we, which is, makes sense, right? How yeah. do we avoid ruining our kids if we're successful? I mean, I've met your kids. They're really great. No, uh, it's mostly your life that's all over the place. They're, they're borderline mediocre. They're, no, <laughs> no, 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 no they're much honest. more stable than you so far. Oh, well, that, that's for sure. I'm, I'm below average on a lot of scales. So uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's, ne you know, very few people, very few small percentage of society are billionaires or even millionaires or successful in any way. So it's kind of natural that just using statistics, it's unlikely that a billionaire's kids are also going to be amazingly successful. But, and I think also when you have every comfort like, I don't know about you, but uh, when I was growing up, not only was I hungry, I was scared. I was scared. How was I going to afford college? I had to pay for every dollar of college myself. How was I going to, uh, you know, survive in the world? I didn't have any backstop. I didn't have any safety net. So I was scared all the time. And that made me extremely hungry to start a business and kind of break out of that cycle of fear. And I think that was also that part of the problem too is when I made some money, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not afraid anymore. And I kind of splurged on that courage until I was afraid again and, and thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I had just won the lottery and now I'm never going to make money again. And so I'm even more scared than I was before because now I have kids to raise and mortgages to pay and, and so on. So I think that hunger 
fed me a little bit, and I know it fed a lot of the people that I interviewed in this book, even more so perhaps. Like, uh, but but then again, I don't know. I don't necessarily know if Mark Cuban was scared or Sarah Blakely was scared. I think they kind of set out. I think I was more scared, which has probably limited me. I think they set out to solve amazingly huge problems. So again, Mark Cuban is a great example where he wa- he was in Dallas and there was no way to listen to basketball games, local basketball games in Ohio. So he creates a company to solve it. He figured, well, why can't you just stream these events over this new thing called the internet? So he created what was called AudioNet, later it was called broadcast.com. And he, and he solved this problem that became a massive problem. Now every day, we stream audio over the internet and video and other things. Back then, nobody was doing it. And so he created the first company to, to make it very simple to stream audio on the internet. And when I asked him specifically, oh, you know, it looks like you made money because of your interests, he actually said, no, 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 no. He said, I was only interested in making a lot of money. I only wanted to be just like filthy, filthy rich. And, but I don't believe it because he became filthy rich by solving the biggest problem in his life, which was how to watch basketball long distance. And he didn't solve it through some other means. He didn't start Home Depot, for instance. He, he started something that was very important to him. And, and I, but, but related to what his answer, I asked him, what were you doing the moment you became a billionaire? And he said, I was in my house sitting naked by the computer and just constantly reloading Yahoo Finance until that moment where I was worth a billion dollars. So that, that, that's more related to his reason for becoming a billionaire, but I think there were other reasons. I believe that 100%. <laughs> I think that's probably what I would do as well. Clicking reload on Yahoo Finance, naked well, in front of my computer. I think the very first time I sold a company, that's what I did. Like I was just obsessed with every dollar tick up or down. But again, it wasn't the reason. I mean, yeah, I, I wanted to make a lot of money, but I did it using something I knew better than other people, which is how to build a website. So usually it's usually you are solving a problem that's important to you to, to make that first amount of money. In the book, you discuss the myth of focus. And I think this is interesting because we see on social media or from any advice that we get from people like focus on one thing, solve a specific issue, do a specific thing, focus on one thing. You kind of, your data anecdotal as it might be from your show and from the book breaks that down. Focusing on one thing often doesn't actually work. Right. Like in a great example is Jeff Bezos with Amazon. He wanted to create the world's largest bookstore or did he? First he said, first he created a bookstore for like half a minute and then he starts selling clothing. Then he starts selling electronics. Then he starts selling food. Then he starts selling a million other categories. Then what was amazing was he abstracts away from that. He says, okay, I have this huge software infrastructure for selling anything and for doing logistics and for storing things in the cloud. So he starts renting out his entire software infrastructure. So Amazon Web Services is this huge multi-billion dollar part of Amazon. And then he he goes even further. Like he, he you know, he's, he's starting space companies and drone companies and you know all, all sorts of ancillary companies uh, richard branson start i think he runs now something like over 300 different companies completely unrelated to each other so i think i think focus ultimately it ultimately limits you because you're putting all your you know all your eggs in one basket you're putting all your chips on one on one on one bet and not having focus allows you to experiment in a lot of different directions and the directions that work, you double down on. So I'm sure Jeff Bezos tried other ideas. I'm guessing he tried other ideas that didn't work and he didn't double down on them. All of these guys or, and ladies tried multiple ideas before they found the right experiment. And I remember even in my first company, yes, we were making websites for record labels it was our main customer and you could probably tell by the my demeanor and the way i dress we were making the websites for all the gangster rap <laughs> record labels like death row records loud records bad boy records and i mean i would have you know some of my some of the people working for me come back from a video shoot 
and say, that's it. I am no longer going to any video shoots where guns are being fired. And so this is actually a major problem in keeping employees motivated for most of our clients. And, but we were always experimenting like, oh, should we start a record label? There was one point where we were pitching to do the website for a tea company, the Honest Tea Company actually. And they, they hadn't yet started, but they were looking for someone to build a website. And we were thinking maybe we should start a tea company. So we started brewing different teas that trust me, were disgusting. <laughs> and uh, you, you kind of, you kind of, a key is, and you see this with a lot of these people as well, the key is you have to constantly be experimenting. You, have const you constantly have to experiment with new ideas. How, does it, how is this gonna work? So for instance, how many people have heard of the 10,000 hour rule for sure. getting better or something? So the, the idea is, and this is popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, that was started by this professor, uh, Anders Ericsson, if you put, if you apply, if you apply yourself for 10,000 hours in, in the field you love the most, you're going to be among the best in the world in that field. And I don't really believe that rule. No, it turns out to not be true at all. I, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that, I think that's right. And I think Anders Ericsson would even believe that, but like there was this golfer who started from scratch and he's like, I'm going to put 10,000 hours into golfing and become the best. He made it to 5,000 hours and he realized he was just never going to be the best and quit. So he wasted 5,000 hours of his life. <laughs> and I don't even know if he plays golf really? at all anymore. And, uh, uh, what, but what I think is more interesting is, for lack of a better term, but just because it sounds nice, is the 10,000 experiment rule. If you do an experiment in something you're interested in, by definition, you're going to learn whether you succeed or fail. So can I, can I give you an example? Okay, I'm going to give you a really dumb example. But that's it, all experiments kind of start off dumb, I think, because whatever, it's like, I'm not like, I'm going to solve nuclear fusion. I'm going to create some stupid app or whatever. But I was at a, a dinner and there, a friend of mine was there who I hadn't seen in a while. And he had a new girlfriend and they were kind of snuggling together. And I'm like, oh, you guys seem like you're happy with each other. And my friend who was, you know, he was smiling and she was smiling. He said, oh yeah, we just had the talk we're, we decided we're going steady. And I'm like, Jason, you're 45 years old. <laughs> like, I haven't heard the phrase going steady since high school. And, and I said to him, what does it mean that you're going steady? And he's like, well, we both deleted all of the dating apps on our phone. So I decided, okay, I'm going to do an experiment. So I spec'd out this app, the going steady app, which if you connect to somebody and you say, okay, I'm going steady with this person. It'll delete all the dating apps on both phones and it'll inform the other side if uh, anybody reinstalls a dating app and then higher and then higher tiers would be you keep track of each other's location or- It sounds you, like the foundation of an amazing relationship. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I bet it would go viral because uh, in, in, in a good way. I bet it would go viral because uh, it would also inform all your friends. Hey, it's going steady. But anyway, so, so that was just an idea. And why are you not a billionaire already? <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. What's the problem? I'll tell you why. Because I experimented and I wrote up the full spec of this, which took about a half hour. That's how complicated this app was. It took a half hour to write, you know, basically describe each page on this app and what this app does. And I put it on freelancer.com. And you know, that's a site where you can hire programmers from all over the world. Programmers bid to do your app. And so about 30 programmers in an hour bid to do this. And I asked the same question to every one of them, which is, can an app see what other apps exist on your phone with both iPhone and Android operating systems? And most of the programmers were like, don't worry, don't worry, we'll, we, we can figure it out. But one programmer said, no, Android, yes, iPhone, no. The iPhone, cannot, an app on the iPhone cannot see app, other apps on the iPhone. And so I stopped doing this app. It took me no money and about an hour of my time in total. And I was able to experiment. Is this something worth trying or not? And by the way, even if I decided to go for it, it was, the bids were coming in at less than $5,000 to do this app. So it would cost like some money, but not a lot of money. So that's what I mean by an experiment. At any given point, I'm probably doing a dozen different experiments just to see what's out there that could work and what doesn't work. And sometimes it's huge businesses that I'm thinking of starting, but it's still worth 
a small experiment just to see it does, does this idea work at all, even a tiny bit. And other things are just stupid that I just want to see what happens. So another experiment I did was, and this one was using another app, like another site like Freelancer, but 50 Shades of Grey at the time, this was several years ago, was the most popular book in world history. Like one out of four books sold in like September of 2014 or whenever it was, was 50 Shades of Grey. So I figured, what if I take 50 Shades of Grey and I look up in a thesaurus every single word and replace the word in 50 Shades of Grey with this word from the thesaurus. So it would be a 100% different book, but also the exact same book. And so I used Fiverr. I hired somebody for like $75 to basically replace every single word in 50 Shades of Grey with a synonym. So again, it was the exact same book. I picked out a cover on Amazon. I uploaded it to Amazon. It's a published book now on Amazon. And what was the title? The title was um, How to Satisfy a Billionaire. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Different from Think Like a Billionaire. So I'm obsessed with billionaires in the title. I thought you would do now. the cynicism thing like in the title. I didn't, I didn't do the cinnamon thing in the title. And, and I, just had, I also used Fiverr to have someone come over the cover for like $5. And uh, the book did not do well. And <laughs> so I figured I couldn't replicate the success of, of Fifty Shades of Grey. But again, that entire experiment took me zero time because I didn't have to do anything. And maybe it took me about $100, cost me $100. So it was an experiment. And uh, again, like I said, every, almost at any given point, I'm probably involved in like a dozen different experiences. Not all of them that stupid, but some of them that stupid and some of them a little better. And I think you have to experiment in life to, to actually learn things. I'll, I'll tell you one more. I did. Uh, let, let me pause you right there for one second. If you have questions for James, you can line up at that microphone for the next few minutes and then we'll call on you. Continue, James. Oh, well, actually, so only a few minutes. I've, I will tell you some more of the habits of, of billionaires just to Why stick not? with the book. But oh, wait. what? I have, a, I have a question. Hold on. Oh, one second. Hold on. All right. okay. Just line up. Be patient. No laughing if you can handle that. And then <laughs> we'll call on you when he is done. So, so I described dozens of habits in this book, but, but three that I've talked about, uh, or two I've talked about so far, and I'll talk about one more. There's the ready, fire, aim habit. There's the idea of going beyond can't. Whenever someone says can't to you, how do you go beyond that? And then all of them, or most of them, engage in some form of what I've described before as idea sex. They take one idea, they take another idea, they merge them, and in the intersection is where they find a billion dollars. So a classic example is Tyra Banks, who's created possibly the most successful TV show in history, America's Next Top Model. You'd be surprised when she came up with the idea, she said to herself, oh, I know all about being a model, and the most popular show on TV right now is America's Got Talent. What about if we just combine them? Ideas, we'll take those ideas, the ideas will have sex with each other. Now we've got this new idea for a show, America's Next Top Model, this should work. She pitched it to TV companies, agents, managers. They all said, that's an awful idea. It will never work, you can't do that. And so she just did it on her own and then she eventually found a TV company that would do it. Now it's in its 31st season, I think. It's in 100 different countries. Uh, it, it generates billions and billions in revenues. It's an amazing, it's an amazing, perfect example of idea sex. And I think you'll find with almost every, so I was talking to Peter Thiel for this book. Peter Thiel started Facebook. And I said to him, how is Facebook different? There was, at the time there was MySpace. And then before that there was Friendster, there was GeoCities, there was Tribe.com. There's been, there's been a ton of social networks. And he said, no. And I'm like, yeah, there have been. There's been tons of social networks. And he said, no, 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 Facebook's very different. It's the first social network with confirmed identity, which was true. And it turns out there was a huge need for people to know who they were becoming friends with and know that it was confirmed. This was, when I'm, when I'm friends with Jordan Harbinger, it really is Jordan Harbinger. And so, on Facebook. And, uh, you know, again, that's like an example of idea sex. So he took social networks combined with confirmation of identity and you combine them together to essentially create a monopoly with even within the social network space and it reminds me too of paypal his first business he took you know the internet combined with commerce and it's the first time it was a totally internet only solution for e-commerce which was paypal 
So again, idea sex is a very important component of what these guys do. It's very hard to come up with your own unique idea. It's very, it's not that hard though, to take two ideas that work and combine them. And, and, and that turns out to be a, an amazing uh, method for idea generation, for creating mil businesses that are worth millions, billions, whatever. In the next 25 seconds, give us a spiel on why people should buy the book. What can they learn that they can use after they buy and read the book? Well, for me, when I reread the book, I'm always, I always forget these. Whenever I do a podcast, I kind of forget almost the entire podcast immediately. Yeah. So it's great to read my interviews and it reminds me of all the things these billionaires have, have been through. All these different ideas like the, 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 the ready fire aim, the idea sex, the getting beyond camp, can't, the, the curiosity, the things that these billionaires value in life. Because I find they very much are willing to take chances that are, that are great. If they seem greater than the chances I would take. But very quickly, much more quickly than I see most people do, they remove risk. They're not really risk takers. They're ri actually more risk averse than anyone else. The, they, they immediately take all the risk out of the equation. So Richard Branson, as an example, didn't, buy, didn't raise money and buy an airplane. He borrowed one. Damon John didn't make $100,000 worth of hats with the hopes that he could sell them. He got the order first, the order for the hats first. So uh, again, it's, it's, it's removing risk as quickly as possible and being as risk averse. As, Damon John didn't quit his job as a waiter at Red Lobster even after he made $100,000 from this first clothing order. He, 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 he was risk averse until the moment where now it's time to take a risk. Now it's time to quit my job and be an entrepreneur. Now it's time to go head first into starting an airline. Now it's time to quit my job as sale, you know, selling fax machines door to door so I could sell a $300,000 order to Neiman Marcus, uh, which is Sarah Blakely's story. And Peter Thiel, you know, he already, you know, had his foot in the door with, with PayPal before he quit his job as the, a top ranking lawyer at the best law firm in the world. So, and, and on and on and on. A, a great example too, I'll just give one more example. Mark Cuban, he, his first company wasn't broadcast.com. Very few of these billionaires made their billion on their first company. So, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Cuban started a software company, which he sold for 10 million. Then he started a hedge fund, which he probably made another 20 or 30 million at. So he was, com he was, he was wealthy, and then he started broadcast.com. And most of these billionaires had the same path. Richard Branson didn't make his billions from music or a music magazine, but he made millions from it. Then he started the business that made him billions. And on and on and on, these people took risk out of the equation so that they could take bigger risks. And so I read it to remind myself of all these habits. And I usually, I'm not trying to get you to buy it. Yes, you are. You are literally <laughs> doing that right now. That but is it's, the whole it's, point of the event. It's why I reread it, because re it's, it's valuable to me. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So if you have a question for James, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll just pass the mic to you. If you have a question for James, raise your hand and they'll pass the mic. I couldn't hear that. I don't know if you guys could. Um, so in the ready, fire, aim methodology, a lot of times the firing step involves something where you're pushing the envelope or something that you said like might not technically be legal uh, at that point. Uh, for example, the square story. So how do you basically try to de-risk it or how do you take that leap of faith saying, even if it's not accepted today, let me just do it. I'll figure it out. So well, the question is, I'll repeat the question just so it's easier. So, and let's make sure I get it right. So in the ready, fire, aim example, how do you de-risk it? Or are you figuring it out as you go along? Did I miss another part of your question? Yeah, like specifically, a lot of things that are not legal are allowed at that point. Uh-huh. Like ah, specifically things that are not allowed or are illegal at that point, specifically in the square story. Right. So... The way, the way you de-risk in a ready, fire, aim situation is experiment as small as possible. Or, you know, and, and I'm speaking of things specifically that may really be impossible because of the rules or the laws. So Damon John was able to do ready, fire, aim and mortgage his mom's house and make all these clothes because he had a huge mega company, Macy's, mega retailer, that was 
they had the check in their hand. They're like, please give us a hundred thousand. Here's a signed contract. Please give us the money. Uh, please give us the, the clothing and we'll give you this check. So that's how he de-risked. It's always a matter of de-risking. And again, Richard Branson didn't put any money to work. He borrowed the plane from Boeing and then he got permission from Heathrow to have a landing strip and then he started an airline. But, you know, with something where the, where the rules are not on your side, you kind of, that's, that's a much more difficult exa uh, example. And again, it has a lot to do with experimenting in very small ways. So with Square as an example, he built a very, and he built and designed a very cheap device, the device that you plug in to your iPhone. And he made it so that it can, pro he built the software so it, you swipe your card through, there's a card reader in the device, it communicates to your bank's credit card processor and it deducts or adds money to the different accounts. So he knew he had that. He had all the technology in place. So when we went to Visa he, and basically said, look, here's how we're gonna handle fraud, which is your big, and then you, then you learn how to answer all the objections. So he knew Visa was gonna say, well, what are you gonna do about fraud? Well, okay, here's how we're gonna deal with fraud. So he had a, examples of how he would deal with fraud. And, he's, and they're like, well, how are you gonna even get this done? Well, we have this little device and the technology to implement it. Oh, well, are you really gonna get a lot of customers? Well, yeah, it turns out there's, you know, 10 million businesses that need this service. So you're gonna make a lot more money. Here's the money you're gonna make within the next month because of this. So he, he answered all the objections. He still put very little money to work compared to what he put to work as he was, you know, adding customers and something and, and, and so on. So all of it is about de-risking, always figuring out how to take all the risk out before you do the aim part where you're really gonna try to get to build your business to be huge. And a lot of that is, again, experiments. Do as many experiments as possible in every industry. Any idea that strikes your mind. You have an idea today. Oh, I'm going to create the Uber of nannies or whatever. Figure out if people need that. Like, do it manually. So a friend of mine was starting a business, and uh, it seemed like a good idea for a business to me, but she wanted to raise $200,000 to create a software product, and then she'd find the customers. And I said, you know what? You could do this manually first. So get 10 customers, perform the service manually, so then you see if there's demand, then you get actual revenues coming in, then you see the nuances that maybe you didn't realize before that you'll need in the software, and then, by the way, it'll be much easier for you to raise money because you'll have customers, testimonials, revenues, uh, uh, you'll know exactly how to design the software, so the software design will end up being much cheaper, and that was a better way to de-risk. A lot of people say, Ideas are worth a dime a dozen and execution is everything. The problem with, with that quote is, is that A, good ideas are still hard to find, but the other problem is execution is hard. So there's a spectrum, you could execute, but if my friend had done it her initial way, she would have executed horribly and it would have taken years to get off the ground and $100,000 or more and she would have had to raise money and then she'd have to find customers Customers would want something different, so she'd have to rebuild the software and so on. So that would have been bad execution. Good execution is, hey, get customers first and perform the service manually, see what they need, get revenues. Now you just de-risk the whole, the whole thing and that's better execution. Execution ideas are a subset of ideas. So you have to still be good at coming up with ideas. It's not like ideas are separate from execution. So again, if anyone says ideas are worth a dime a dozen and execution is everything, that's one one thousandth of the story. It's very hard to have good execution. So de-risking, experimenting, constructing experiments that that prove your 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 idea is critically important. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you both for this. I've followed both your careers for a really long time. Um, one thing I was curious about is we hear the concept of blue ocean and it seems like some of the billionaires got into industries where they weren't familiar but already existed, but others sort of created new lanes and spaces where there weren't much competition or if any. So where did you find people navigated the most success and that they had sort of the least challenge? Was it creating something brand new that they just saw need and a gap? Or was it just being better in an industry that maybe already existed even though they weren't in it? That's a great question because, so actually you wanna repeat the question? Yeah, can you rephrase it? Do you, since you- Yeah, on. so I think you're asking, did a lot of these people find more success 
in an area where zero businesses existed before, or did they just take some existing business model and make it better, and that's how they succeeded? And is that the question? So yes, that's the question. So very few billionaires take an existing business and make it better. I think that's actually extremely rare. And the reason is, for most people, they can't tell the difference between 50% better and 0% better. They don't know. Like the average person on the street can't tell if, you know, one clothing store is that much better or one fashion line is that much better than another fashion line. But what people can tell, or, or, or for instance, take podcasts. Jordan and I both do a podcast. We both have different interview skills and, and in some cases, you know, very different, in some cases very similar. But it's very hard to tell for all the podcasts that are out there, who are the best, you can't rank the interviewers from best to worst, because it's, it's hard for the average person who doesn't do a lot of interviewing to, to notice the subtleties and who's a better interviewer, who's not, a, who's not as good an interviewer. It's very difficult to tell. What you have to do is be different. It's easier to determine difference than better. I always know if somebody's different. For instance, if I listen to a podcast where they're not doing interviewing, they're doing a true crime story. That's different than Jordan and mine podcast. So maybe I'm gonna listen, to, I'm gonna pick one interview podcast randomly because I can't tell who's better. And then I'm also gonna listen to a true crime podcast. And I'm gonna pick one randomly because there's a thousand of them out there now. And I'll pick the one that maybe I'd be interested in, but I still can't tell who's better or not. And again, you know, PayPal, which is Peter Thiel's first company, wasn't better than any other e-commerce payment company. It was the first. You know, Amazon wasn't really better than any other book online bookstore. It was it was the first. Facebook, you could say, wasn't the first social network, but it was like Peter Thiel corrected me. He found a he he found the blue ocean within the very crowded space of social networking. He found face you know it was a social network combined with confirmed identity. So often you could find blue ocean by taking two established business models and combining them to see to find that intersection that's empty. And that happens in almost all the cases. Now, you don't have to be a billionaire. Just doing that with even small business models can be a millionaire. Again, like my first business, which created websites for large Fortune 500 companies, I, I wasn't necessarily better than my competitors, which was my problem. And I wasn't different from my competitors, which is why it was a much smaller business. I wish I had done something different. And I didn't do that. I didn't kind of take the intersection of two models and, and, and see what was there. So trying to think of a, an example where one of these billionaires just did something, just simply did something better. Sarah, you know, Sarah Blakely made, you know, women's undergarments, but if you're wearing them right now, you know that they're very different than the average undergarment. She really innovated the whole industry. Uh, so I would say, yes, most businesses are blue ocean, but that ocean might be, it might not be blue, blue oceans for billionaires, and maybe, maybe there's like blue pond for millionaires, but it's still gonna be empty and it's probably gonna be the intersection of two other established ideas because that helps you de-risk as well. One more question. Uh, um, I was wondering, uh, these uh, billionaires, when they build their businesses, do they, re um, so let's say in Mark Cuban's story, after he had the first two businesses, he already had 30 million, and now he's founding the broadcast.com. Do they use their own money, or do they rather always prefer to try the capital markets and raise the money, and what are the advantages if they decide it either way? So do billionaires use their own money to invest in their new companies or do they use, or do they access the capital markets? What are the advantages? Yeah, that's a great each? question. Cause I've always been curious about that as well. So I was talking to um, Naveen Jain, who's a chapter in this book. So Naveen Jain made his first several billion on a company called Infospace, which went public in the boom in the nineties. He cashed out at the right moment and then the company crashed to the ground. But since then he started many other companies. And then he started a, a company, I believe it was called Moon Express. I, that, I think that's the name, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that company was to mine rare earth minerals on the moon because 
you know, rare earth minerals are very valuable for so many purposes, but most of the rare earth minerals, because they're rare, are not really on the earth. They're in other parts of the universe. So, I mean, the most of the rare earth minerals are either in China or Greenland, actually. And, uh, and by the way, uh, there's a company in Greenland called Greenland Natural Resources, completely owned, 100% owned by the Chinese. So, so I'm, you, get, you have to get nervous about where all the rare earth minerals are. So I asked him, he, so I called him and got him on my podcast after he raised about 30 or 40 million for this company. And I said to him the exact same question. I said, why did you bother going out? It's hard work to raise money. Why did you go out and bother uh, raising 30 or 40 million for this company when you could have just dug into your pocket and put 1% of your net worth into this company? And he said, he said because you don't know, you don't, you don't know by yourself if something's a good idea. Something's a good idea if it can sustain, sustain itself in various ways. Either it's raising money from others at first or having customers is a great way to know you have a good idea. But if he had just done it himself, it's just this billionaire's toy rather than something he knows might, have a, a, might be a good idea. And then when you raise money as well, it's not, you're, you're not just raising money from a bunch of random people. You're, you're, you're getting potential partners, potential customers, uh, in the fundraising round, if you do it as strategically as possible, well, everybody you raise money from, they're going to have skin in the game for your success. And so if they strategically can help you. It's the same reason why crowdfunding is, is on Kickstarter is so successful. Let's say you make a, a game. Okay, call, let's say you make a new version of Monopoly. All right, uh, you take all of Trump's hotels and make a kind of Monopoly around it. And it's kind of a fun little game and the community chest, you can get it. You have to... You have to go to the impeached square every now and then, and you're frozen there until you roll double sixes or whatever. Anyway, you want to you want to make this game. You can make this with the money in your bank account. It'll probably you come up with the idea. Or go to a printer. You can make this game for less than a hundred dollars. But wouldn't it be cool if you go on put this on Kickstarter and ten thousand people put up ten dollars each or fifty dollars each in promises of getting the game for free once you make it and and then there's higher tiers. Maybe they get the neck, the, the, the Trump, Trumpopoly 2.0. They get the, you know, if they put in a thousand dollars, they get, you know, other, you know, rewards. But now, what did you do? You created a built-in customer base. You have ten thousand customers. You automatically know uh, are going to get your game. Now you know it's a good idea before you even made the game. So, so you didn't have to crowdfund to pay for it, but it gave you something other than money. So if you're, a lot of these guys, they get something other than money when they raise money. It, just like we, everybody here in this room can do with a Kickstarter or crowdfunding or whatever when, when you start an idea like that. That's it. I wish well, we had time for more. But we don't. Well, uh, first off, thanks very much to Scribd for both publishing this book as a Scribd original at, at Scribd.com. It's uh, uh, just... It's an amazing experiment you guys are doing to publish originals, and it costs you essentially nothing to publish them. So it's a very good experiment. I congratulate you on that. Uh, and thanks for having me uh, come out and speak here and getting Jordan to interview me. Again, we both did this for free and on our dimes. To oh, I got you didn't get paid? I didn't get paid. No. So <laughs> Jordan, this is awkward. Jordan got paid, and uh, I didn't, and I flew out here. But uh, uh, it was another good experiment on your part. And, and thank all of you guys for, for coming out. It's, uh, it's really nice to, to have met you and, and seen you here. And um, I guess I'll, how about I'll take one more question as a final question. I don't, I don't okay, fine. <laughs> go ahead. Not my show. There you go. So, uh, have you ever considered that it's not the individual that becomes a billionaire, but the company itself? Yeah. So again, we talked earlier that maybe some of these billionaires got lucky. Maybe there's a lot of people with lots of ideas who have all the same skills and just the ones who kind of fell into the right idea and made the right business are the ones who succeeded. But other people with the exact same skills started bad companies and didn't succeed. So that's kind of what you're asking is about survivorship bias. But then again, if you take By the time your company is worth like three hundred billion, million, whatever, uh, then it's not your it's not your company. You're not the only decision maker anymore. Like once you get to a certain scale, 
you're not just like, hey, let me wing this yeah. ish like so, so that's Richard a good, Branson. So that's a good question. I'm sure many people did get up to 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, and they either cashed out or maybe their business didn't succeed after that, or maybe the business flourished, but because they weren't the main people anymore, other people kind of took the upside. You know, other, another person becomes CEO, another person becomes an investor, and so on. I'm sure that's happened quite a bit. But one thing in common with every single one of these billionaires is they all picked great, great people to work for them. So I mentioned in the book, Ken Langone specifically says, there are no self-made billionaires. He says, I am, he kind of claimed he wasn't a billionaire, but whatever, he, he is. Uh, he said, there are no self-made billionaires. Everybody has a huge number of people working for them who are all A plus people. You can't have even A minus people. You have to have A plus people that you delegate. You can't do everything in a billion dollar company. So you have to delegate to other A plus people to help you. He said with Home Depot, he's because of Home Depot, an extra hundred to 200,000 millionaires were created out of all of the initial executives and all the initial stakeholders in his success. So he knew very early on, he's got to delegate. And by the way, he studied other billionaires along the way before he made Home Depot, which by the way, is a combination of big box stores like Walmart and mom and pop, you know, houseware stores. There was no big box houseware company until Home Depot. So he had idea sex combine the two things. But before that, he was a banker and he took companies public. He was the first person to take Ross Perot's first company public. He made Ross Perot a billionaire. So he studied the habits of a lot of other billionaires and he knew the most important thing was as soon as possible, delegate to the absolute best people and have a, a support structure underneath you so you can focus on, on the things that you're good at, whether it's the ideas or the execution or product development or sales. You gotta, he knew very quickly, focus only on what I'm good at and delegate to very strong people the best. One more story on that. Mark Zuckerberg was offered you know, a billion dollars for Facebook by Microsoft, uh, or it was either Microsoft or Yahoo, let's say it was Microsoft, and he turned it down. So he was like a 24 year old kid, he would have made $200 million and he turned it down. Meanwhile, every other social network was, was going bankrupt. So he was taking a risk. And I asked Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook, why did Mark Zuckerberg, if I was 24, I would have taken a $10 million offer, let alone a billion dollar offer. And Peter Thiel said that he actually wanted Mark Zuckerberg to take the deal as well, because he would have made a lot of money. He invested a half a million dollars when Facebook was worth nothing. But Mark Zuckerberg said, if I take this money, what am I gonna do for the rest of my life? I'm just gonna go back and create another social network because this is what I'm interested in. So why, I already have a social network. I don't need to take the 200 million and, and make another one. I already have, I'm already doing what I'm doing. So, and of course the rest is history is worth like $60 billion or whatever it is right now. So I think there's a certain drive and obsession as well. You have to be obsessed with every detail. There's a story of Sam Walton when he was building Walmart, he used to go into every, I don't know, Kmart or clo you know, discount clothing store. And he would go to like where the, you know, underwear was on the racks and he would make notes. Is it, is it, you know, did they, or did they organize them? Is it dirty here? Is it clean? And he figured out for each store, what was the ideal formula of how he would stock the shelves. He was just obsessed with every detail. He, he was there with his CFO of, of Walmart. The CFO was waiting out, outside and kept wondering, where is Sam? I, I thought he had gone outside. He, Sam's lost. And instead Sam Walton came out like a half hour later with a full pad full of notes about this rinky dink little store in the middle of Iowa. And cause he was obsessed with every detail. And so there's a certain obsession involved as well. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. And thank you, Jordan, for interviewing me. Always a fan it. of your podcast. Thank you.